Thank you. The next item of business this afternoon is a statement by Derek Mackay on the air departure tax update. The Cabinet Secretary will take... Sorry. Point of order from Mr Kelly. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary is about to give a statement on air departure tax. However, the details of the statement uh, are revealed extensively in BBC Online and were discussed by Glenn Campbell on Good Morning Scotland uh, this morning. In addition to that, the implications of the statement are reported in the Scotsman online, and it's clear from the Scotsman transport correspondent Al Sardorn's Twitter feed that he's been in discussion with Scottish government officials about the implications of this statement. I therefore submit, presiding officer, that Parliament has been disrespected uh, in this regard. The, the point of a parliamentary statement is to inform MSPs and the public uh, first and foremost uh, not the media. Therefore, I would ask that you investigate that parliamentary rules have been broken by Mr Mackay and what action can be taken. Can I thank uh, Mr Kelly for his point of order and for notifying me in advance. Uh, as members will be aware, I do take this matter very seriously indeed, and I recently revised the good practice guidance on announcements to make it clear that government announcements should be made to the Parliament in the first instance. And I note that there has been speculation on the contents of this statement in advance, and I would draw the Cabinet Secretary to the guidance, draw the Cabinet Secretary's attention to the guidance. However, I'm sure that all members will welcome the opportunity to question the Cabinet Secretary on the detailed contents of his statement, which he can now make. Thank you very much. Officer, this government has made a strong case over many years for powers over air passenger taxation to be devolved to the Scottish Government. We have set out a clear aim to reduce the burden of air passenger taxation by 50% and to abolish the tax altogether when resources permit. That commitment will both help to boost international connectivity and generate sustainable growth, priorities that are even more pressing as a result of the EU referendum. In 2014, the Smith Commission recommended devolution of powers over air passenger duty to the Scottish Parliament. The Scotland Act 2016 made provision for that devolution. And following extensive engagement at with stakeholders, we introduced the Air Departure Tax Bill to Parliament and the Act gained royal assent in July. Under terms agreed between the Scottish and UK governments and the fiscal framework, APD is due to be fully devolved in April 2018, and Revenue Scotland has worked well in hand to begin collection. If the UK government were handing over the tax in a fit state, Parliament would now be considering regulation setting out tax bans and rate amounts, but that is not the case. During stage one of the bill's consideration, I alerted the Parliament to an important matter which has arisen concerning our plans to replicate the current APD exemption for passengers who fly from Highlands and Islands airports. <clears throat> the Highlands and Islands exemption has applied under APD since 2001. It is a feature of air passenger duty and should be a feature of air departure tax, supporting not just residents but also businesses and tourism in the area. As members will know, this government and this parliament cannot act in a way which is contrary to EU law. And after very careful consideration, we have concluded that in order for the Highlands and Islands exemption to be compliant with EU law and state aid regulations, it must now be notified for approval to the EU Commission. As member state, only the UK government can do this. This is not a technical argument. Aviation is critical to the Highlands and Islands region helping to support a diverse range of businesses and also enabling residents from the more remote uh, regions to access essential services that cannot be provided in their areas. And without it, there is real risk that the Highlands and Islands will suffer economic detriment. Since informing Parliament of this position in April, I've had a series of discussions and exchanges of correspondence with UK Treasury Ministers, most recently with the Financial Secretary to the Treasury on the 25th of September. Throughout the conversations and correspondence, I have been clear that whilst we remain committed to working with them to secure an acceptable resolution, it is for the UK government to resolve this issue as the EU member state. It is only the UK that can take forward any notification. The response thus far from the UK government has been disappointing. The Financial Secretary to the Treasury made clear in July that they have serious concerns over making an approach to the Commission. In correspondence, he stated that before they will agree to do so, the Scottish Government would need to accept full liability for all risks, including the potential for knock-on effects from the Highlands and Islands business. As I will explain, those risks would include liability for the historic operation of the tax, 
accepting the financial consequences back to 2001. If the Commission does not approve the exemption and the cost of avoiding detriment on the Highlands and Islands during the length of time that notification would take. In transferring responsibility for the tax, I am clear that the obligation was on the UK Government to ensure it could be operated fully. The conditions the UK Government have sought to impose are clearly not acceptable. Having got us into this mess, it is patently unfair that the UK Government is only willing to fix it if the Scottish Government agrees to pay the cost of any mistakes made. So let me be clear, this Government will not put at risk the economy of the Highlands and Islands and it is not for this Government to bear the cost of the actions the UK have taken if they are found to be not compliant. This Government therefore finds ourselves placed in a deeply unsatisfactory position. We could choose not to introduce the exemption for the Highlands and Islands flights. This would ensure the ADT remains within state aid rules and avoid the need for notification. But it would bring an unacceptable cost to the fragile economies of the Highlands and Islands. Or we could seek an alternative approach that would deliver the same outcome as the exemption. I and my officials have left no stone unturned in investigating ways to deliver the same or indeed better outcome for the Highlands and Islands without a notification process. Whilst there are solutions within state aid that would support the residents of islands and sparsely populated areas, we have no legal viable exemption that would support businesses and tourists and provide the good connectivity that is vital to the city of Inverness on the same terms as is currently available. The UK government has also suggested they would consider alternatives. However, they have yet to present any options we have not already considered or that meet the requirements of the Highlands and Islands and will not also require notification to the Commission. The only option the Scottish Government has identified that does not require notification to the Commission and that could be in place for April 2018, securing the benefits of the exemption for the Highlands and Islands, would be through the use of rates and bans, and in a way not exclusive to the Highlands and Islands. This would involve setting all bans at zero rate to cover direct and connected flights from Highlands and Islands airports. To do so would involve the Scottish Government foregoing substantial revenues, not to deliver any additional benefit, but simply to deliver the tax to the same standard for the Highlands and Islands as it currently operates. To match the exemption for all Highlands and Islands flights, including connecting flights, would require the Scottish Government to forgo revenues of more than £320 million. And to do so, simply for band A flights would mean foregoing revenues of around half of that. Whilst under the terms of the fiscal framework, this government would of course bear the cost of any policy changes this parliament makes, such as reducing rates to deliver economic growth, it should not cost this government financially simply to deliver the tax as it currently is. That is the principle of no detriment set out by the Smith Commission and which underpins the fiscal framework that accompanies the devolution of powers. That principle is central to the operation of the block grant adjustment However, the block grant adjustment mechanism for ADT does not take account of the potential flaw in the Highlands and Islands exemption. The block grant adjustment will currently see Scotland's block grant reduced by amount forecast on the delivery of the tax as it currently operates. And as a result of the position we have now been placed in, I have not yet been able to set the exemptions, reliefs and rates I propose for ADT in the coming year. The UK Government has suggested that rather than go ahead with notification or face removing the exemption, that we could defer implementation of the tax for an unspecified time period. A change to the timetable is certainly feasible. The UK Government must switch off the tax before EDT can be introduced in Scotland and may be unavoidable if a solution is not found. However, this is not our preference. I have therefore written to the UK Government again today to set out my position. I remain supportive of notifying the Commission but not of the Scottish Government taking on the risks for the UK Government's operation of the policy. And I'm very aware that the European Commission will need time to consider any case made, so it is already unlikely that we could get a decision from the Commission in time for ADT to begin in April 2018. Instead, I've suggested that the UK Government agrees to amend the block grant adjustment to enable the Scottish Government to deliver support for the Highlands and Islands in a way that ensures neither the Highlands or Islands or Scotland's public finances suffer as a result of this apparent defect in air passenger duty. This amendment could be made whilst notification is pursued on the understanding that the UK Government accepts the risks inherent in such a notification, or it could be made on a permanent basis if the UK Government remains unwilling to make such a notification. It is the only solution that either Government has tabled that would enable ADT to be implemented on time 
and in a way that protects the economy and the communities of the Highlands and Islands, the devolution of powers under the Scotland Act, and is consistent with the no detriment principle of the Smith Commission. In order to determine our approach, we require clarity from the UK Government by the time of the UK Budget at the very latest. And we would urge all stakeholders and interested parties to encourage the UK Government to reach a sensible solution. Given the severity of this issue, the potential impact on the economy of the Highlands and Islands and the risk to the devolution of powers as agreed by this Parliament, I felt it incumbent on Government to air these issues in Parliament and to be clear to the region and industry where we stand in relation to the introduction of ADT. And I hope that all members will support the action we are taking. I know that some members do not support our general position on reducing ADT, but this is a different issue. It is about our ability to deliver this tax as it stands today. A delay is not my preferred option. I could only agree as a last resort, but I cannot see ADT put into operation in this significant uncertainty hanging over the Highlands and Islands. And I therefore urge the UK Government to step up to the plate, to recognise their responsibilities and to support our proposal, which would enable ADT to go forward as planned without causing harm to the Highlands and Islands communities. Thank you very much. The Minister will now take questions on a statement. There will be around 20 minutes, and I would urge members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons now. I call on Murdo Fraser to be followed by Neil Bibby. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement? The Scottish Government's policy of reducing uh, air departure tax is a long-standing one and has been eagerly awaited by our tourist industry. It is a policy which, as he knows, has the support of the Scottish Conservatives, so there is a clear majority in this Parliament to deliver it. It is therefore very disappointing to hear today that the Scottish Government seem to be trying to weasel out of their manifesto commitment to deliver on this policy, meaning we could miss out on the boost that this would deliver to the Scottish economy. There will be many in the tourist sector in Scotland who feel badly let down by this announcement. And the cynic might conclude, presiding officer, that today's announcement has more to do with politics and the SNP's desire to pally up with the Greens again to get their budget through Parliament rather than with any legal technicalities. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary two questions? Firstly, as the Highlands and Islands APD exemption has existed without challenge for the last 16 years, why do the Scottish Government believe that there is suddenly now at this convenient point, an insurmountable legal problem, which means the devolution of this tax might have to be delayed. And secondly, can he confirm for the record that it still remains the Scottish Government's policy to deliver an ADD cut as a matter of principle to help grow the economy, even if he is today starting to make excuses why he cannot deliver it on time? Cabinet Secretary. Well, you know, of all, of all the uh, bizarre accusations that Murdo Fraser has ever made, about the Scottish Government to then also accuse the UK Government with conspiring with the Scottish Government not to deliver an SNP policy is a, a bewildering one that even Murdo Fraser, I'm surprised, is, is willing to make. You see, this is an issue of the UK Government's making. This is an issue of the defective, the defective state of this uh, function and this uh, uh, taxation uh, proposition. Now, the question, the question, well, I know Labour are partly complicit as this uh, as well, in that you probably weren't compliant uh, either. But in terms of Murdo Fraser's direct question, I'm very surprised that a, a member of Murdo Fraser's standing isn't aware that the Scottish Parliament simply cannot pass legislation or orders that contravene EU law and regulations. I am so surprised that Murdo Fraser, as a front bench <laughs> spokesperson, doesn't know that simple fact about the function and operation of this parliament and the parameters in which we have to operate. As to the question of, in principle, yes, SNP policy remains the same, government policy remains the same, but what we are being asked to do, and I'm surprised to hear heckling from the Labour Party on this, because I know many Labour members with an interest in the Highlands and Islands will want us to protect the Highlands and Islands as we deliver air departure tax. Very surprised from the opposition eh, from the Labour Party on this one. What we have said is this power is in a defective state. We'll cooperate with the UK government to try and resolve it, but it is for the UK government to, uh, to resolve. They have created the potential non-compliance issue, not the Scottish Government. We believe in the outcome of the Smith Commission by way of no detriment to the people of Scotland. That's what we are trying to protect in terms of protecting the Highlands and Islands. That also includes a like-for-like -like exemption 
and ensuring that we protect the devolution of powers, but in a competent fashion, not the typical bombastic, chaotic, incompetent fashion uh, that the Tories have been engaging with uh, recently. So we will try and find uh, a resolution. The principle remains the same, but it must be implemented in a competent way. Neil Bibby to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Neil Thank Bibby. you, President Officer. Passengers in the Highlands and Islands have received an exemption for years and exemptions must continue. The devolution of APD was agreed by the Smith Commission three years ago and it's been SNP policy for many years before that. Now the Minister is today telling us that he can't switch on air departure tax despite the Parliament passing a piece of legislation agreeing to do so. Today we see the SNP use a convenient opportunity to kick a bad policy into the long grass. Let me be clear, the SNP's ADT cut is bad policy. Instead of delaying it, it should be cancelled. Will the Cabinet Secretary confirm that it is still his intention to cut £190 million from public services, or will he rule out a cut in the lifetime of this Parliament? In any event, how can the Cabinet Secretary justify a multi-million pound tax cut for the frequent flying few at a time of real hardship and austerity for the people of this country? Isn't it the case that they support a tax cut that was rejected in their own consultation, that would increase aviation emissions and would strip hundreds of millions of pounds out of our public services? Mr. Secretary. I think the most important point in that uh, commentary or question was, was the first sentence of what Neil Bibby said, which is that the exemption must continue. The exemption as it stands cannot continue. And UK government has not found a solution to that, other than propose that the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish government, and therefore the people of Scotland should bear the risk of liability from that historic uh, lack of compliance because of lack of notification. Not the Scottish government's doing, but the doing of the UK government. No wonder they wrote to me to suggest notification, but only if the Scottish government takes the risk for that. That is in clear breach of the no detriment principle of the Smith Commission and the enhancement of powers under devolution. So I agree with Neil Bibby about trying to ensure that the exemption continues. I've raised this in Parliament when we introduced uh, the legislation at stage one and I have said repeatedly I would try and find a resolution working with the UK government. But it's for the UK government to resolve any lack of compliance because of the information that I've shared earlier about how this Parliament and government can conduct its business in accordance with EU law uh, and regulations. So in principle, we, we stand by our, our position on air departure tax and the economic benefits that would come from reduction. But we will not land upon the people of Scotland, pardon the pun, a defective power, a power that may cost uh, dearly the people of Scotland if it's found not to be compliant once you consider that issue. So looking after the economy, supporting tourism, protecting the highlands and islands, ensuring that there's a competent transfer of, of powers is important to this government. But if the key ask from the Labour Party is that the exemption must continue, that is exactly what I've been trying to achieve. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Willie Rennie. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Uh, this policy hasn't exactly had the smoothest of takeoffs, has it? Under scrutiny, it's clear that the government hasn't even bothered building an economic case. It's been clear that there's no environmental justification for this policy no social justice justification for this policy and no political support for it other than the Conservatives who want to cut every tax going and keep spend, spend, spending from the magic money tree. And now the policy is stuck in a legal quagmire that the Minister must have known lay ahead of him. I understand if he needs a technical pretext to spare his blushes on this one, but wouldn't it be simpler and cleaner just to acknowledge now that he won't be cutting aviation taxes in the coming year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the timetable in terms of what we can do is uh, in accordance with my statement in the hands of the UK government to consider the proposition that I've put to them in advance of the budget. They can do that and respond at the latest by their budget and that then helps inform uh, the Scottish budget. Unless they can find a legal remedy to this or a fiscal remedy to this, the UK government have a responsibility to address the issue. And I, I, I know that it would be difficult uh, ever to convince Patrick Harvey 
uh, or, or the Greens of this particular policy. But the, principle, but the principle we all agree on is the successful and competent delivery of devolution. And in this defective state, it cannot be delivered in Scotland. And it is for the UK government to uh, resolve in the fashion uh, that I've described. Willie Rennie. Liberal Democrats are pleased that the APD cuts have been stopped. But does the Minister not think the statement today will force the European Commission to take action to close down the Highlands and Islands exemption? He describes the scheme as defective and not compliant with EU law. So in order to provide himself with political cover, is he not re recklessly risking the future of the discount? Is that not the case? Cabinet Secretary. Could you imagine the champions of transparency in the Liberal Democrats, what they would have said if I kept this a secret from yeah, Parliament yeah, as to the complications, lack of compliance, and why we couldn't pursue the like-for-like like exemption. I think Parliament has to be fair here that I raised this at stage one. I've raised it in committee. I raised it when being pursued by Conservatives as to why the exemptions weren't on the face of the bill. So I have been transparent uh, with Parliament and I think it's important to tell the truth to this Parliament about the condition of legislation, uh, the arrangements around the Smith Commission, the no detriment principle and what it would mean to the region, a very important region that is the Highlands and Islands. They would be sacrificed if we didn't address this issue uh, in the correct way. So I've kept Parliament up to speed, been transparent, engaged with UK Government to find a solution, but it is for the UK Government to resolve this issue. Now, of course, there is risk in being so transparent as to how the EU responds uh, to the issue, but the, the, the request from the UK Government was that the Scottish people should take that risk for the UK Government's lack of compliance over the years. That is the burden that they should bear in uh, resolving this issue so that we can deliver the powers in a competent fashion that protects every part of Scotland. Thank you. The opening questioners and answers have been, um, had some time to explore this issue. We've now got less than we've got about nine minutes and ten questioners. So uh, progress, please. No preambles, no statements, just straight to the question. Marie Todd to be followed by Bill Bowman. Thank you, presiding officer. You mentioned that state aid solutions wouldn't apply to Inverness Airport, and the UK government stated that they would also consider alter alternatives, yet hasn't presented sufficient options. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the UK government, forgetting to flag Highland and Island exemptions to the EU, is symptomatic of the UK government forgetting the Highlands and Islands for centuries? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> the, the Scottish Government in outlining this uh, statement today is clearly not sacrificing the Highlands and Islands and I'd encourage the UK Government to do the same. Bill Bowman to be followed by Kate Forbes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm if he has considered devolving this tax to Highland Council and that the exemption would not then come under state aid rules and if so, why he ruled it out? Cabinet Secretary. Well, that, that hasn't been put to us in a state that would appear to be compliant with uh, state aid uh, regulations and EU law. That, like many other matters, we could consider further, but there's a range of complexities in that and other propositions that may be put to us. If that is now the position uh, of the UK government, I don't believe that that would be compliant, uh, but I'm happy. Well, I hear the Conservatives shout it's a suggestion. I've said I'll look seriously at any proposition put to the Scottish Government to deliver uh, this uh, power and this tax in a, in a competent way. But it strikes me the suggestion I've put to Bill Bowman wouldn't be uh, compliant, but I'll take all uh, helpful suggestions uh, into account. Equally, I hope the UK Government will seriously consider the suggestion I've put to them today. Kate Forbes, to be followed by James Kelly. Kate Forbes. Thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide um, unequivocal assurance to the communities of the Highlands and Islands who are most affected by this that he will continue his unwavering efforts to protect the Highlands and Islands and recreate a like-for-like -like replacement of the current exemption, one that covers residents and businesses and tourist visitors? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I will, and I hope this statement makes that clear. That's exactly what I'm endeavouring to do. James Kelly, to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Se Secretary accept that week after week we hear in this chamber from members who have issues with cuts in the health service, education services and local councils? And therefore, does he not accept that it's time to 
dump this discredited policy that would strip £190 million from the Scottish budget every year? Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure James Kelly, probably now having seen my statement and probably wasn't quite what he had read in the press, which probably removes the complaint from the, the start of the statement, will now understand that is not what this debate is about. It's about the compliance of the regime to ensure that the power can function competently in Scotland, in keeping with the Smith uh, Commission and the agreement that all parties signed up to, to enhance devolution, but in a way that didn't bring detriment to the people of Scotland. Surely the Labour Party haven't given up on that as well. Richard Lyle to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is an absurd situation that the UK Government can effectively block the implementation of Scottish Government policy by refusing to notify the European Commission? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's true to say that the UK Government will not uh, go through the notification procedure unless the Scottish Government bears the risks of doing that. And that means it's the Scottish taxpayers that would bear the risk from the operation of a historic policy under UK Government. That's the difference. And that's what I'm trying to point out uh, to members uh, in the Chamber. So, yeah, it is an absurd uh, position, but hopefully the UK Government will work constructively with us to be able to proceed. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Ivan McKee. Thank you. May I bring members' attention to my register of interests? To ask the Cabinet Secretary what the cost of his U-turn on air passenger tax will be to the tourism industry and wider Scottish economy. Yeah, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Oh, of course, it's the Tories that did U-turn their position on the tax reduction in any event. Let me be clear to Rachel Hamilton and others. We are trying to proceed, but we need the UK government to give us the mechanism to deliver this tax competently. So it's back to the UK government to resolve this uh, power, which is currently in a defective state. So if you want to talk about cost to the economy, before we even mention, of course, uh, Brexit, then I think it would be wise for Rachel Hamilton to turn their attention to the UK government to find a resolution to this issue. Ivan McKee to be followed by Jamie Green. Ivan McKee. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any information on why the UK government failed to notify the Commission of this exemption for 16 years? Was there not a requirement on the UK government to do so, and were they not aware of this requirement? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think you can tell from the, the content of the statement and the correspondence that I've had with the UK government that they are very reluctant to seek notification. Uh, that would suggest to me that they are concerned about compliance, and that's why they're trying to pass the cost to the people of Scotland. And that's a compromise or a sacrifice we shouldn't be willing to make. Jamie Green to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Jamie Green. Uh, presenting officer, contrary to the uh, Cabinet Secretary's statement today, my understanding is that the UK Government has bent over backwards to work with the Scottish Government to find a solution on this. So I can't be the only person that's deeply suspicious about the motivation behind today's statement. Does the Cabinet Secretary really believe that the Parliament will be fooled by his full concern over the devolution of this tax? And why doesn't he admit that this has nothing to do with the EU and everything to do with backtracking on his promise in return for support from the Greens? Cabinet Secretary. So I should ignore all the officials' advice I've had, all the engagement I've had with UK ministers, successive uh, Treasury ministers, uh, to believe that under Jamie Green, a Tory minister or someone in the Tory party told them it's all OK and I'm just making it up. Well, I can assure um, Mr Green that uh, my correspondence uh, and engagement with UK government ministers, I think, will show uh, that they accept the issues uh, that are here and I think that's why to be fair to them they want to find a solution to this but thus far they failed to do so. Bruce Crawford to be followed by David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary, I think you recognised in your statement that the cross-party Smith Agreement that helped deliver the devolution of the air passenger duty, the Smith Agreement is also very clear on the principle no detriment as a result of the further powers devolved in the 1916 in the 2016 Act. Can I ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary if he agrees that failure to replicate the Highlands and Islands exemption as a result of the UK Government's negligence would be a significant issue of detriment and therefore contrary to the intent and purpose behind the Smith Commission proposals? And it's nothing to do with the EU, Mr Green, it's everything to do with the UK. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, that, that's right. This is about the competent devolution of powers as agreed by the Smith Commission. And in fairness, the, the issue 
wasn't raised over the course of those negotiations, as far as I understand it, by the UK government to say, oh, we have an issue here uh, around compliance. So it's fair to say the principles that all parties signed up to in terms of successful further uh, devolution and the fiscal framework and how it relates to the block grant adjustment is a political agreement. And yes, to proceed uh, in the way that the UK government uh, proposes would be a breach of that political agreement. And finally, David Stewart. Ah. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, what assessment has the Cabinet Secretary made of the effect on the Highlands and Islands airports and the Highlands and Islands economy if the exemption does not continue? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, I know that David Stewart, because he has been lobbying me, as have other members eh, on this issue of exemption, will know that many involved in the sector would say it would have a catastrophic eh, impact on the economy, that fragile economy eh, around connectivity, if the exemption couldn't be continued. We've looked at a legal remedy, we've looked at the fiscal remedies to try and achieve that. But I have no doubt, for the reasons I've given in my statement, that it would have a profound, a profound uh, impact on the Highlands and Islands. And that's why we must, together, uh, endeavour uh, to ensure that we can uh, replicate that exemption uh, to ensure uh, that it can continue. And that is why uh, UK government, having failed to give me a, a competent alternative, I've put a further proposition to the UK government today to consider and hopefully they will uh, respond in good time uh, so that I can uh, take this matter forward. Thank you very much and that concludes our statement. Yes, Kate Forbes. For the record, can I remind you and the Chamber that I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Ms Forbes. That concludes our statement on air passenger duty air passenger duty and uh, we'll now move on to the next item of business which is a statement by Keith Brown on Scottish City Region Deal's next steps. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of a statement. Any member who wishes to ask a question should press their request to speak button now.